Hello, my name is Chris Fox, and I'm going to go through how to start an ultrasound-guided IV on your difficult-to-stick patients. Now, ultrasound's wonderful because you can readily visualize the vascular structures, gives you real-time eyes to see exactly where your needle is going underneath the skin line. And this makes you more accurate, it shortens the time to do the procedure, it decreases complications. We can use ultrasound-guided procedures all over the body. Basically, anytime I take a sharp object and need to put it into somebody's soft tissue, I can do this uh, for a variety of procedures. Today we're going to be talking about vascular access. With ultrasound guidance, you have less arterial punctures. If you're doing a central line, you have less pneumothoraces, less needle stick attempts, and I think maybe the most important thing on the screen there is less needle redirects because the complications are pretty uh, rare, but what is very common is somebody having a difficult uh, pain issue when they're uh, having an IV started, and with ultrasound guidance, it goes right in, and this makes it more comfortable for our patients. Now, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality is this big uh, research watchdog agency, and they came, they did all this uh, meta-analyses and looked at all these studies, and they said, you know what, ultrasound guidance during central line insertion prevents complications. And so that's why physicians have been placing ultrasound-guided central lines for years and years and years. But um, what about peripheral lines? Uh, this is a study that said, hey, you know, maybe we put in a lot less central lines if we teach everybody in the hospital how to do a peripheral line. So what they did was they did a big retrospective study where they did a, an educational event where they taught everybody through the hospital, nurses and techs and doctors, how to do an ultrasound-guided peripheral line. And they found out, and what they wanted to see was, does the rate of central venous lines go down? Like, do we put in less central lines if everybody now can get a peripheral line in a difficult-to-stick patient? They did about a couple of hours of education, and what they saw was that, indeed, over this five-year study period, the rate of central line, uh, the rate of central lines went down by 80%. And this was on the ward, this was in tele, this was, you know, the floor, the ICU, all over uh, the hospital, including the emergency department. And, um, and yeah, even as the ED volume was going up, the central venous catheter rates were going down during the study period because everybody's putting in ultrasound-guided peripheral lines on those difficult-to-stick patients. So how do we do it? Well, I'm just going to review the anatomy really quick. Um, this is the, uh, the antecubital fossa right here, right? So what we see is the cephalic vein. It runs on the, uh, the forearm. It runs in a superficial way and then goes up the, uh, on top of the bicep up here. You can see it here on my, I took a picture of my arm here to show you. <laughs> Just kidding. I wish that was my arm. Uh, you can see the cephalic vein here coming along, and uh, it comes along here, and then eventually it makes its way up to the, the upper uh, arm as well. And uh, also we can see the basilic vein. This is the most, one of the most common veins you'll ever cannulate here. The basilic vein is down here. A uh, superficial vein down here it turns into a deeper vein as it goes um, up here. We can also see the median vein of the forearm is seen here, and the, uh, the median cubital vein in that AC fossa is a very common uh, vascular access vein. It eventually joins up here with the, um, the basilic vein. There are a lot of um, anatomical variants in here, so just sort of keep that in mind as we go along here. But this is the basic vasculature of the upper extremity. In general, you really want to hit a superficial vein and not a deep vein. You want to avoid the deep veins, even though um, in somebody who's a difficult stick, you may end up having to do a deeper vein. But you can see here the cephalic vein is nice and superficial. When you get into these deeper compartments uh, here in the, uh, the upper arm, here's the humerus, you can see that that uh, basilic vein, um, it's a nice target. However, it is... Um, it's in a deeper compartment, and you can see how if there was infiltration, you would you could get a little compartment syndrome going on in here if there if the vein if the catheter fell out of the vein and you know maybe a CT scan was like pushing in a contrast load or something. So so just be careful with that. You always want to be as superficial as possible whenever you put any IV in, and you also want to be distal. Like you want to be uh, down in this region whenever you can. Sometimes it helps to start with ultrasound up here in the AC and kind of move distally, or you could start start down here by the wrist and move um, superiorly uh, up here, proximally up here this way. So, but this is the general region I want everyone to really focus on. 
I save the uh, the deeper vessel, the basilic vein, for somebody who really has no other options. And then this is uh, almost always an option then uh, for you if you do need a, um, a peripheral line and you're trying to avoid a central line. You can almost always find this one. So, um, yeah. The uh, Just a quick review on what things look like on ultrasound. Normally, here's your skin line up here. Uh, in the very superficial part of the skin line, we call the epidermis. And then you get into this hypodermis. You can see down here that has some uh, subcutaneous fat and stuff in it. Fat looks very hypercoke, and then hypocoke, hypercoke, hypocoke. It's various echogenicities. And then between the, um, the hypodermis and the, sub and the uh, muscle layer, you've got this very thin area of fascia, subcutaneous fascia layer you can see uh, right here. And so, uh, and then you get down here into the muscle, and then you get the hard tissue, which is this bony structure here. And I'll go over that in a little bit more detail. Tendons uh, are really pretty on ultrasound, and when you when you stretch out the probe in the longitudinal plane along the tendon, you'll see these fibers. They kind of stretch out across the screen, um, uh, such as that. And when you move the joint, uh, you can see the tendon actually move along its um, its path. And so you can say, oh, that's a tendon. It's very fibrillar in nature when I stretch it out in its long axis. And as I if I was to move this finger here, I would see uh, the tendon move along with it as well. And then muscle appears pretty much hypoechoic for the most part, but you can see these hyperechoic linear fibrillar strei coming along when you stretch out the muscle in its long axis. When you move the muscle into its short axis by rotating the transducer, of course now it's more punctate and hyperechoic punctate striae are seen here. Again, long axis, nice and long fibers here. Short axis of the muscle, cross-sectional view here, more punctate. And uh, you can see here, too, the bone is also has this round structure here. So bone looks very hyperechoic in its longitudinal plane here. Longitudinal plane, this nice intact bony cortex here, this hyperechoic. It's the most dense thing in the body, so it's going to be the most hyperechoic. Okay. Here is uh, another long bone coming along here. And then there's a joint right here. The bones come along, and as they stop, and then there's a joint, and then there's another bone. Go back one slide here. We can see what the short axis of a bone looks like, the curve structure there. Now, what about nerves? Um, if you move the probe so quickly up and down the arm, if you think you're looking at a nerve, uh, you'll, that's the best way to look at it. So here's the, the bone here. This is the radius, and we can see the radial nerve. It's this hyperechoic structure here, very hyperechoic, fibrillar. Uh, structures look like honeycomb sometimes. This is the radial artery, by the way, over here, and the nerve. These neurovascular bundles kind of tend to run together. So here's your radial artery. And we're just kind of moving the probe up and down the arm in a short axis. You can see the radius bone down here. Again, this is all muscle here, subcutaneous fat or hypodermis up here. Vascular structures are seen pretty easily using the color flow. Uh, here you can see the pulsatile nature of the arterial structure and the continuous flow seen here in the venous structure. Uh, if you compress uh, arterial structures enough, especially in somebody who's hypotensive, you know, somebody who you need to put an IV in to, to treat their hypotension, uh, these vascular structures, these arterial structures will also easily compress. Because normally the way you tell the difference between a vein and an artery is just compress. And a vein should be easily compressible, whereas an artery should stay open. Um, but uh, when you're uh, when you've got something with high low blood pressure, the artery may compress if you if you push hard enough. So just keep that in mind. I tend not to use the color flow whenever I'm looking for a vascular axis. I tend to just compress, 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 and things that are easily floppy are veins, and uh, things that wink back at me when I push down on them are um, arteries. Now the beam angle is really important. Normally um, with B mode, which we use almost exclusively when we put in uh, lines, is uh, you want to have a perpendicular is going to give you uh, the best possible reflection. So you want to avoid coming at the coming at your structures at an angle. But whenever you use Doppler, of course, cosine of 90 theta, cosine of theta is in the numerator of the Doppler equation. So it can't be at 90 degrees whenever working with our Doppler signal. Just keep that in mind for a later day. That's a little um, pro tip for you. With the Doppler, you want to be off perpendicular. Uh, but with B mode, uh, perpendicular offers the best reflection to see the most crispest image. And what I mean by that is you put your probe down perpendicular uh, to the skin and don't angle it if you're looking just at 2D, which is how we do lines. So uh, you want to cover the probe 
uh, with the tegaderm. This is putting in a peripheral line is a semi-sterile procedure uh, that requires you to keep the probe. Um, the probe itself, we wipe them down with chlorhexidine each time we use them before and after each use, and then they're pretty clean, but just to be on the safer side, I always put a tegaderm right on top of the transducer. The bigger, the better. You can use these little ones, but I like using a larger tegaderm here because I've just folded over. You don't need any gel between the probe and the tegaderm. However, you will need to put sterile jelly, like um, sterile lubricating jelly on top of the probe. The gel that comes in the bottles when you normally do ultrasound is not sterile. You want to use sterile lubricating gel on the top of the probe here whenever you're doing an ultrasound guided peripheral IV. Now you want to clean the skin with, um, with some chlorhexidine sponges. They come in the IV start kits as opposed to just alcohol. I know, we, you know there was a lot of practice before just using an alcohol swab, then putting an IV in. But the chlorhexidine gives you like two days worth of coverage instead of just four hours with the alcohol alone. So use these every time at standard of care. And then to hold the transducer, you want to use the C-grip, uh, which is where it's the most comfortable grip for you. Uh, people tell you all kinds of ways to hold a probe. I think this is going to be the most comfortable way whenever you're doing an ultrasound-guided peripheral IV. And, uh, and you're going to put a tourniquet on, the proximal arm. We can see the tourniquet here. And then uh, you're ready to go. This is not a complete project yet because we don't see the tegaderm on the transducer. I would like to see that there the tegaderm on the transducer. And then hopefully all this gel here is not just gel from the ultrasound bottle, but this gel is actually from the uh, sterile jelly. Now, what about the angiocath length? This is a hotly debated issue. Uh, we, uh, you can read about complications in the literature where if you use a standard one and a quarter inch long angiocath that you're used to using whenever you put a peripheral IV in, the problem is, in most of these difficult-to-stick patients, um, there's um, there's going to be now a probe in the way. So the catheter needs to have a longer throw. You want to have, like, at least 50% of the catheter within the lumen of the vessel after you place the IV. This helps reduce the fact that if the patient was to, you know, bend their arm, the, uh, the catheter tip could pull out and then infiltrate and cause a complication. So you want to use longer angiocasts in general. We like the longer 1.88-inch uh, long angiocasts as opposed to the normal, like, 1.16 or whatever. So use the longer angiocasts whenever you can find them. Minimum, though, I think is going to be that 1 and 3 quarter inch long angiocath. Now, uh, again... Uh, this is just a, a demonstration on a, on a, a phantom uh, example, so they're not wearing gloves, there's no tegaderm, um, but what you want to do here whenever you do an ultrasound-guided peripheral IV is you want to have the indicator on the probe aimed towards the procedure doer's left. What does that mean? There's a little dot on the screen, okay? And with that dot, what you're going to have is it's going to line up with the indicator side of the probe. So if you're, imagine you're looking towards the ultrasound monitor, okay? You've got the sharp object here in your dominant hand. You've got the blunt object here, the probe, in your non-dominant hand, in this case the left hand, holding the C-grip. Uh, you're stabilizing the probe on the patient's skin. And now you're looking up in your field of vision. Over here somewhere is the ultrasound machine. I just have it down here. So at the ultrasound machine, this dot over here, this is corresponding to where the indicator is on the transducer. So in order so that the, if you were to go like right to left underneath the probe, it would have the same effect on your ultrasound screen, right to left, that these two things are in sync, okay? This is important. So the indicator should always be towards your left, the procedure doer's left. No matter what procedure you're doing anywhere in the body, uh, you want to make sure that because sometimes you come in, here's the needle coming in here, here's your target. The needle is too far to the right. We need to, we need to move the needle from left, I mean, I'm sorry, from right to left underneath the probe so that syncs up on the screen and where things are aligned. Okay, so just, if that's confusing, just memorize this and you'll be good to go. Uh, so this is what it looks like here. We're compressing. We see a couple vessels on the screen. The artery stays open when we compress. The vein easily collapses. Now, that point cannot be uh, more important, that the vein needs to easily collapse. Because if it doesn't, that means it's not a good vein to start an IV on. Um, if there's a clot in the vein, uh, the vein is like hard and it won't compress. Um, and veins that don't compress when you push on them with the ultrasound are not viable veins and should not be used for IVs. 
And so I like what's kind of going on here. I see the artery next to the vein. The depth is a little bit deep. I'd want to maybe decrease the depth so this takes up more of my screen real estate. Depth's at 4.7 centimeters. You could decrease the depth, and these structures will appear larger on the screen. It makes the procedure a little bit easier to do. Uh, again, the idea is as long as the vessel is centered on the screen, therefore it must be underneath the center of the probe. So all you got to do is aim the needle underneath the center point of the transducer's footprint. Okay, think about that for a minute. That's very simple. <laughs> We're, I mean, I've almost already made too much of it. I mean, here's the, the, this is the footprint of the probe here, seen on the skin line up here. The indicator's right here. My probe indicator, my hand, is to orient it towards my left, which is the left side of the monitor. Now, all I gotta do is make sure this vessel's down the center of my screen, and then all I gotta do is basically take my needle and wedge it underneath the center of the probe. And that's what it looks like. Here's another example here. My vessel is centered on the screen. It's nicely compressible, compress, get it lined up just right underneath the center of the screen. I stick my needle underneath the center of the probe and boom, cannulation, look down and now you've got uh, hopefully a flash coming back in your needle. Another example here, we're compressing. Okay, it's not on the center yet. We got to kind of get this centered, get this down the center. There we go, we're trying to center it on the screen. And there's some tools, the various ultrasound machines have tools to remind you. They might have like a little a little marker that comes down the center of your screen to remind you, hey, dummy, keep this thing centered. And then you just aim the needle for the center of the probe. Done. Um, an example here, again, here we've got our C-grip. We've got the tourniquet on. And as we're compressing, we're aiming uh, the needle for the center of the probe, right underneath the dead center of the transducer, because hopefully on the screen, the vessel's down the center of the screen. Um, now, uh, here's the thing. This is what we call the uh, the out-of-plane technique. Let me skip over here. So as the needle is coming down, okay, here's the probe angle. Angle number one, angle number two, angle number three. And I told you that perpendicular offers the best reflection ultrasound beam-wise, and that is very true. But uh, in this case, the needle is coming along like this, okay? And if the needle tip is right here, when the probe is in the number two position the needle tip is out of the plane still, right? So what we're doing here is we're advancing the needle until we see it. If this is the target where the red thing is down here, the needle tip, if the probe is in the number two position or perpendicular, the needle tip will pass through the sound on its way to the target. So after the needle tip goes through the sound, what will appear on the screen is part of the needle shaft as the tip is on its way to its target. And so, on ultrasound, all we see is just an artifact on the screen that is a metallic needle. So if you want to angle the probe and follow the needle tip, you would need to go from position one to position two to position three. Imagine in position one, oh, now we see the needle tip, and we can gently fan the transducer, watching the needle tip, following it to the target. So this is called the out-of-plane technique. The other way to do this is to rotate the probe so that the needle is underneath the entire beam of the sound, and we call this the in-plane technique, okay? The problem, though, with the in-plane technique, unless you have the needle perfectly aligned underneath the center of the sound, and by the way, the sound is only one, meter, one millimeter thick, so unless you've got this needle perfectly underneath a one millimeter sound beam, and it will look like this, it'll look pretty. Otherwise, if you're off axis at all, if you're oblique at all in this in-plane approach, then the needle tip will actually be a lot further down through the tissue, but you'll be mistakenly uh, looking at this. See, that's why this is really tough to do this in-plane technique. So I teach everybody, start with the out-of-plane technique. Yeah, you can fan the probe following the needle tip as it goes towards its target. Uh, but, uh, but it, so this is the difference here. Here we are, out of plane needle positioning. I tell people to start, and really my nurses kind of taught me this, to be honest with you. I was doing all this out of plane stuff, and uh, they said, yeah, this is great, Fox. We do this out of plane approach, and then once we cannulate the vessel, we then rotate the transducer 90 degrees so that we can see the tip and shaft of the needle underneath uh, the probe. Once they get the cannulation going, then if they need to troubleshoot, they rotate into the in-plane technique. So 
You start out of plane, and if you need to troubleshoot, you go in plane. Okay? We're going to practice this with some tissue models here in a minute. But uh, here's one more reason why the out of plane technique is this is the pitfall to the out of plane technique. So you don't know where on the screen you're going to see the same kind of artifact on the screen no matter where the needle tip or shaft is underneath the sound beam. So just keep that in mind. Uh, you want to follow the tip of the needle as it's coming towards its target best you can. So this is why I don't like to start in the long axis uh, technique. So here we see the vessel here, and we're advancing the needle. We're advancing, advancing, advancing. And oh, oh, is that the needle uh, track here? Oh, yeah, here. I think I see the needle here, and I'm advancing, I'm advancing. And uh, next thing I know, I've hubbed the needle. Like, I've got the needle all the way into the hub, and I don't have a flashback yet. Now I'm fanning side to side with my ultrasound beam. And all of a sudden, I get off to this. Uh, oopsies, here it is, way down here. I completely missed the target altogether because my needle wasn't exactly underneath the perfect mid, um, the perfect longitudinal plane of the sound beam. So that's why that's a little bit of a problem. But this is what it looks like if you were to actually do this in-plane technique. You would uh, take the needle uh, and put it underneath the edge of the probe. But, I mean, the probe is only, the sound that comes out of the probe is only one millimeter, and your needle itself is about a millimeter thick. And then the vessel, you got to keep it across the longitudinal perfect axis of the vessel. And, uh, and that can be a little bit tricky to do. So, uh, but when you do it, it does look pretty. So I actually start out of plane. My nurses taught me this. And then after I get cannulation, I rotate to be in plane. And now I can see both, uh, the needle and the vein in that in plane technique. This is a peripheral line here. Uh, it looks like a pretty big vessel. This could be the basilic vein actually. And then the angiocath you can see is sort of coming out over the needle in entering the vessel. And angiocaths look like those big, long um, uh, equal signs when they're in the vein. Here is um, another example here. We're really trying to troubleshoot in, in plane technique. You can see we're going side to side through some muscle. Here's the vessel here. Here's the vessel here. It's kind of tortuous coming along here. Here's our catheter, this equal sign coming along this catheter here, uh, this equal sign, and then here, that catheter is all the way through. It's nicely placed in that uh, longitudinal vessel. When it slides in that easily, it's in the vessel and not in um, the this you know the superficial soft tissue. Now, sometimes this happens so quickly that you didn't get a chance to grab some images. This is one of my fellows, ultrasound IV, no images because I nailed it that quick. Boom shakalaka. That was the <laughs> the little uh, love note that he sent me. Thank you very much. Uh, however. We really do want to uh, grab these uh, images as we're doing this. Ultrasound requires you to archive the image and make a, uh, a note in the chart. Uh, so there's a there's image archival and uh, reporting in all of ultrasound, whether you're doing a procedure guidance or you're doing um, a diagnostic ultrasound. That is the standard of care. You want to archive the images. And you just hit, I hit clip on the machine, and then that grabs the, uh, the clippers you're doing it. Uh, it's pretty easy to do. Or once you can see the needle tip in the vein, you can just grab a still image. Something needs to be archived, though. So just to take home messages here, strong evidence of literature, we should be doing ultrasound guided uh, as opposed to landmark approach, especially in those difficult-to-stick patients. Uh, ultrasound guides prevents a lot of unnecessary central lines, and so this is good for our patients. Uh, it's it's a little hard to do when you first started. There's like an extra, you need, a, like it, sometimes you think you need a third hand, but over time you get used to it, like everything else in life, and this becomes, um, this just makes you a lot better at um, taking care of your patients. So you're going to use a high-frequency linear transducer, put a sterile cover over it, try to find at least a 1.75-inch angiocath. You're going to aim the indicator on the probe to your left, the operator's left, so that the probe and the, and the monitor are in sync with the dot on the left side of the screen and the indicator on the probe oriented towards your left. You're going to center the vein under the probe, aim the needle for the center of the probe. It's that easy. Start out of plane, and then if you need to troubleshoot, you can carefully rotate the transducer 90 degrees and be in plane to see if your catheter is going the vein the correct way. All right. Good luck, and now we're going to practice.